Hello, welcome back to the channel. Just like most of you, I have invested hundreds of hours to the Fallout franchise. And until today, I'm still captivated by both the beauty and terror of the nuclear wasteland. The charm and its whole appeal, there is nothing like it. Trying to explain why Fallout needs to have a better sequel might sound a bit redundant now. The fact that Fallout has become one of the most well-known RPG with their latest entry generated over $750 million in its first day in retail. But behind the success of Fallout 4, thoughts from fans of the series are divided. Fallout 4 is garbage. That's great, but to call it a bad game is honestly disrespectful. Fallout and its development is rich with history, as it went from humble beginnings to a hit with its own cult following, through trouble development and bad decisions, to change in ownership of its intellectual property towards its eventual revival. The game evolved from being an isometric open-world RPG into a first-person open-world RPG, together with a major change in design philosophy and game direction. Are these the actual cause to such divide among fans? Why does the latest entry in the series receive much criticism despite being the most profitable? And how do we learn and adapt from the previous entries so that any future sequels would be able to cater not only to the fans of the new, but the old as well? Fallout 4 released on November 10, 2015 to a critical acclaim. Fallout 4 was given a facelift running on a newer engine which brought improvements to its graphics, dynamic gliding, weather system, and cloth simulation. Overall, the wasteland never looked this good. While Bethesda's creation engine was adapted from the old game view and constantly received improvement over the years, to this point however, it is not even on par compared to other commercially licensed game engines such as Unreal and CryEngine, which arguably has become an engine so powerful and robust it was used by AAA developers and indies alike. It is not unheard of that some AAA developers prefer to run and publish their games through a proprietary game engine. Ubisoft pretty much developed their own game engines and it has spawned multiple varieties to fit their gameplay needs. For Bethesda, however, Creation Engine has quickly become updated and arguably has reached the limits of the possible. Instead of having their workforce and budget, siphoned into upgrading the game engine, why not license an engine or even run on one of their proprietary game engine? It tech. Not only Bethesda are able to focus their whole development on making the actual game, but commercial game engines are streamlined and easy to work with for both professional and amateurs. Hence, the experienced development team are easily up to speed. Unlike any other RPG such as Stardew Valley, FTL, that run with minimalist graphics, Fallout as a modern RPG definitely benefit from a better game engine. While Fallout to its core is a role-playing game, the addition of first-person shooting is a welcome change. From here going forward, Fallout series probably will continuously embrace its first-person shooter gameplay because it's easy to get into by newcomers and the flexibility to cater to most demographics is in favour to Bethesda. However, the gunplay mechanics was heavily criticised on previous Fallout 3 for being awkward, wooden, and was nearly unusable. But it was given a minor facelift in New Vegas through scope aiming, gun modification and bullet types and eventually received a major overhaul in Fallout 4. Responsiveness and accuracy have never felt this good in Fallout thanks to the help from 8 software. The first person shooting mechanics was modelled after Bungie's Destiny. The improved shooting mechanics are a welcome change and while it is already near perfect, there is always room for improvements. In addition to the shooting mechanics, weapon customization is, is something that was well received by fans. Taking inspiration from the previous Fallout New Vegas, 
the ability to have a pipe gun modified to fit your character and the way you play can easily drain hours and hours from you in a good way. But mechanics and game engine aside, let us not forget what is actually the secret to a great Fallout? What are the backbone, the blueprint to an experience of the perfect nuclear apocalypse? Hello and welcome to the Brotherhood of Steel. May I ask your business here? I'm sorry, I, I really can't. They, they said not to. Goodbye. Fallout has always been about player's choice and their ability to do things either differently on each playthrough or do whatever fits the role that they are playing. The previous dialogue system worked flawlessly because it blends nicely into gameplay. You just knew where to ask and the rest of the conversation is nicely laid out to you. Benny is my prisoner. You can ask and answer as you see fit. Previous Fallout works because of the player's ability to learn more through questioning, utilize skills in speed checks. You're asking me to accept a bribe. I'd like to make sure the risk to my career and freedom benefits the families of my troop. And simply, the dialogue tree just makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, about that. Fallout 4, taking inspiration from other RPGs in the market, such as Mass Effect, decided to adopt the Four Choices dialogue wheel system. How did you remain hidden all this time? While I appreciate that Bethesda will to innovate, or in this case, to adopt a mechanic, this eventually results in your character conversation to be terrifyingly limited. Hey there. Limited conversation in an RPG is not at all a good thing now. See, most probably this mechanic was adopted due to the inclusion of voice protagonists. War never changes. Which is at times, I'd say, rather quirky. What happened here? It was a nice addition. But the reason Dialogue Wheel works with BioWare's RPG because that their story are predetermined. Shepard was written true and true as a savior of mankind from the get-go. And you can't roleplay him otherwise. He may fail or he might win fighting the Reapers based on your choices, but you can't roleplay him as a rogue specter or anything else. Compare this to Fallout. The reason previous game leave you a plate as blank as possible, for you to put a role in, you can roleplay as you see fit. Ah, you're here. As you have probably experienced, previous Fallout contains speed checks relevant to certain skill and perks. Skills in medicine would help you talk your way into getting more meds from Doc Mitchell, for example. I ain't got much, but it'll do you more good out there than it will in here. Take what I got. Skills in buttering generally have you receive more rewards and great deals. You made your point. I can provide people with some leather armor and extra ammo. Sure hope it's worth it. This time, however, you only use charisma. Just charisma. No matter what are the circumstances, only your charisma come into play to intimidate. You stop waving that gun in my face, or it's gonna involve me. That's it. You're dead. To seduce. I was wondering if we could get to know each other better. Oh, really? Go on. To butter. A hundred caps seems light. You think you can play me for a sucker? One hundred caps a piece and that's it. This renders skills and perks pretty much useless in conversation. It is also hard to predict what your character is going to say and being voice acted, you cannot predict how his or her delivery is going to be. I'm calling it right here. This world can officially bite my ass. This lead to modders to mark the dialogue system to a hard list of the things the player character is actually going to say. And from the looks of it, that is what the fans preferred. Going forward, as admitted by Todd Howard himself, it is preferable for the next Fallout to adapt the classic conversation system instead of the dialogue wheel. It just won't work. No, I can't wait for the world to end. <laughs> That's the spirit. Whoa, easy there, easy. You've been out cold a couple of days now. Why don't you just relax a second? Get your bearings. In the old Fallout series, the origin of the protagonist is pretty much left to the players to decide. Though you are given a predetermined backstory such as being a vault dweller, the descendant of a vault dweller, or perhaps a courier, the rest is simply up to your imagination and how you choose to play. New Vegas and especially Fallout 4 suffers for giving the protagonist perhaps too much history. 
In New Vegas, you are a courier with a bit of history that is revealed in the Lonesome Road DLC. Although this history is rather light and you are still given some freedom to conceive and roleplay your character as you see fit. In Fallout 4, however, you are an ex-soldier who married to a wife named Nora. And she had a law degree. So proud of her. And you two had a baby. How are the two most important men in my life doing? What if you don't want your character to be an ex-soldier? What if you want her to be a pre-war scientist? This might sound like a nitpicking, but understandably the game intro was made to fit into the main story. But players are able to accept that a war hero are able to handle guns and use power armor. But a lawyer who shoot guns and use power armor? Suspension of disbelief can only go so far now. However, you can applaud Bethesda for trying to come up for something new. Having a wife and husband murdered and a baby kidnapped only to wake up later in an apocalypse wondering what the hell is going on was a good premise. That being said, if only the backstory was given much more time for players to invest emotionally. Give some room for it to be open-ended. It could have been a better intro. Understandably, this could be due to the criticism of the Fallout 3, which, if you remember, the intro sequence was drawn out and took too long. But it seems this was misunderstood by the developers, as I believe the long intro sets up the whole atmosphere and building intrigue about the wasteland before the eventual reveal. Although the criticism still stand for some fans that the intro took too long, this is mainly due to the players had little involvement, simply wait for dialogues and do limited actions. Intros to Fallout games should be simple, as blank a slate as possible so that players can fill in the gaps to their backstory, straightforward so that multiple playthrough is not cumbersome and build the intrigue to drive players to the main story. The game was rigged from the start. Fallout is probably the first of its kind when it first came out. Unlike the well-known Ultima series which forces the player to be heroic and constantly on the righteousness path. Fallout is extremely graphic for its time. It took players into mature themes such as murder, prostitution, which makes its entry into the European market troublesome and results in various forms of censorships. The freedom of choice in the series is beyond comparison to any closely related RPG and groundbreaking at the time. Save a town or destroy it. Work with convicts or against them. Military operations are classified information. Fight for humanity or against them. So what shall it be? Do you join the unity or do you die here? These are the things that players should be able to do in Fallout and it is up to the players to ponder and decide the weight of the actions and accept any ramifications that come after. Players should also have the ability to outright disagree if they wanted to. They live in pitiful squalor. One best example is when I was in Jungtown. Upon entering a casino, it is a local boss intrigued in seeing me as an outsider intend to hire me for a cleanup job. So Killian's been breathing down my neck and I'm starting to take it personal. <laughs> and that's where you come in, Slick. Considering I was at low level and simply trying to rush through the town at the time, I decided to decline the job and went back to it later. Now, in most modern games and some RPG, if you were to say no to a quest, they would usually handle it by leaving the quest idle and expect you to accept them later. How can we do this without you? But to my surprise, the casino boss, feeling compromised, ended up having me kill. Can't let a word of this get out. Is O. Show our newfound friend what we do with people who say no to me. So I quickly took my gun out and killed him, losing the opportunity to do the quest. I was surprised that the game are not afraid to let me face the possible consequences compared to Bethesda's design philosophy of constantly rewarding the player. My favorite sort of ego-stroking design to make you feel great moment in any game is Peggle. Have you, everybody here played Peggle? Have you finished a level? If you haven't, all levels end this way. You could take a lot of these things. 
take something like the old Robotron. You take something like that, can you give it good story context? Can you give it a sense of pride when you accomplish? I'm pretty great. I think I'll play another level. Play Fallout again, and you see a lot of things can happen against you. Push a man too far, and he will have his guards to deal with you. You can barter as much as you want, but too much can do you no good. One is okay, two is too much, and that was two. Hell, you can even get extorted by a doctor. Another great example is how you decide what to be of Benny when you finally face him at the casino in New Vegas. What in the goddamn? You can shoot him. We got a problem, boys. You can have him pay you your contract and he runs off. Where's my manners? Here's some cash up front. There'll be more where that came from. Or talk your way into the penthouse and kill him there. Or discuss your wish to work with him. You help me and before long the chairman will rule all of Vegas, dig? Or maybe forgive him. You forgive me? After what I done? Baby, are you trying to make me cry? I don't know what to say. Words don't begin. The least I can do is copy the presidential for as long as you want it. Or maybe if you play as a female character, you can seduce him and kill him afterwards. You're one sick pussycat, baby. Huh? Oh! Or just let him escape and he will eventually capture by the Legion. Go ahead and laugh, baby. I ain't blind to the humor in this situation. Where you can fight with him in the arena, or you can have him crucified. You sick, vindictive fuck! Happy now, you twisted bum? Well, I ain't gonna give you the satisfaction. Maybe you just want to let him go. That's it, baby. Time to vacate these premises. Or just kill him. This level of choice is unfortunately missing in the main story of Fallout 4, and Bethesda was criticized heavily for not being able to reproduce this level of detail, despite having longer development time and overall greater budget. Unless the writers and the quest designers of Bethesda are able to provide this kind of fidelity in its design, Fallout will most probably stagnate over the next few releases. Questing is the backbone of an RPG. Without a good well-written quest, game mechanics, great lore, and the whole labor of love put into game design were pretty much useless. The player simply won't have the drive and the intention to progress. The whole experience ends up being lackluster. Uh, take Dying Light for example, the main story is at most lackluster and a, a villain so cliche is laughable. Crying! But when Dying Light is lacking in its main storyline, it shines in its quest design, crash writing. Kareem, I got Gersel's money. I fucking hate myself now, but I got the money. And overall execution. Dying Light may not be an RPG, but in many ways, it may surprise you. If you were to start an any side quest in this game, you will often be tricked to think that this is just another fetch quest. She left this for you. Grab a chocolate for this crazy guy. Look, Gazi, if I bring you your movie, will you let me come in? Oh, and, and she also wants chocolate. Check up on this guy and this point on map here. We never heard from them after that, until today. All right, maybe I'll go out and have a look. Or even answer to a distress call here. Hey, Troy, there's a distress message coming from the fan zone. That place should be empty. Yeah, or maybe I'll check it out. But this is where the excellence of the game really shows, as it often subverts your expectation and pulls the rug under your feet. This guy says his mom needed a chocolate for a special occasion. You got him a chocolate, and look at that. His mom has been dead for a while. Or a simple quest of checking up with a group of other survivors shows a grim reality of relying and trusting a man who is not only unreliable, he won't put his trust into this, killing everyone as a result. Jafar, I think I found Hansen. He's been dead for a while. What about the others? I'll let you know when I find something. Jafar, I found the rest of his group. They're all dead. They killed themselves. Why? What the hell happened? Looks like Hansen switched on the security grid and then fell. The rest of his people got stranded on the roof with no way down. Looks like they eventually ran out of supplies and decided to to cash out. They, they couldn't get into the building? Well, it seems Hansen had the only key. Guess he didn't trust anyone else. <sighs> no, Hansen never trusted other people. Yeah, it's too bad they trusted him. Thanks for going out there, Crane. Jafar out. 
Even your noble intention to have survivors in need may result in your own demise. To anyone who can hear this, our situation is dire. There are women... To anyone who can hear this, your situation is dire. I've killed women and children here. Tell me what's happening. I'm in the fan zone. This place is a trap. Keep people the hell out of here. Now take your own advice and get out of there. What makes this quest great are not necessarily in its trees, but rather the whole quest was built with the theme of apocalypse in mind. Each quest is made to make the players to take a deeper look into what society may become in the event of an apocalypse. How everything is morally grey, how the rest of us trying to cling to how little humanity we had left. The quests are so fitting with the theme. Even the whole quests are great to talk about and are worthy of its own video. Perhaps I'll make one and talk about quest designs in the future. The Fallout series itself is full of great quest design. It was definitely has been talked to death. A channel here on YouTube called Game Maker's Toolkit has made a great video at which she discussed an in-depth analysis of quest design. One of the best examples in the recent memory was Beyond the Beef in a Fallout New Vegas. In short, the amount of choices given to the player in handling the challenges and finishing the quest really shows the potential of great writing and well thought out execution. Overall, Beyond the Beef is a fantastic example of a role-playing quest. Fallout 4, on the other hand, tackles its quest rather differently. The best example can be seen in the The Lost Patrol quest, which would start when you stumble upon a battle site. I hate to think of what happened here. What ensues is a hunt for this remaining distress signal and discover a series of tragic events for Brotherhood of Steel and its units. Hours since I set my distress pulser. There's been no word from the Paladin or Ferris. My orders were to hold this position at all costs. The entire site has been overrun. When your pit boy picked up the distress signal, it gives off an audible beep, which will get stronger the closer you are to a source. You will often stumble across these signals in challenging areas, sometimes in a mutant infested solar array, a well bunkered military site. You will discover these holotapes which give you an insight to what has actually happened. Ah, this is Ferris. It's been two hours since the paladin left my leg. Collect enough of these holotapes and you'll eventually be lead to an old bunker. Ah, get to the bunker up north. You'll survive. That's all that... Uh, all that matters at which you discover they, that their commander ran off and left his units behind. Who sent you? How did you get in here? Are you... Brandis? What? Who are you? Where did you hear that name? I followed the distress beacons left by your team. Their holotapes led me here. The others? What... Uh, what happened to them? They're dead, Paladin. I recovered their tags. You... You... you did? Thank you. It is up to the player to feel sympathy or disgust for the commander. The whole quest was great, but it was pretty much a hunt for clues and results in, in it being rather linear compared to other quests in the series. Fallout 4 also suffers as everybody in the wasteland is treated as either they are the absolute good guys or the absolute bad guys. Gunners, raiders, or default fractions that simply shoot and rob you on sight. While the Minutemen, the Railroad and the Brotherhood are the default good guys with a sprinkle of dilemma here and there. You can't criticize these factions, you can't debate with these factions and you're simply an errand boy most of the time and somehow treated as a savior at the end of the journey. Infiltrate the facility, secure the transmitter and bring it back here. So what do you say? Are you willing to lend the Brotherhood of Steel a hand? In Fallout New Vegas, if you were to analyze and give the factions much deeper look, you realize that none of them is the ultimate good or bad guy. And if anything, they sat in between, being grey. On your first or any early playthrough, you cannot help but assume that the New California Republic or the NCR were the good guys. 
they don't shoot you on sight. They willing to trade with you. They erected farms and revived old technology. They seem like the recognizable old governments watching over the Mojave to maintain peace and order. It is only much later on you realize that most of the time they are not doing a very good job at it. The administration was stretched too thin. We set up here with our sights set on annexing New Vegas. If anything, they annexed us. They rake in the profits from our soldiers and we're stuck protecting them from the Legion. Not exactly the plan. Their paperwork is mostly a burden to the settlements. Their currency and the exchange rate are not exactly fair. The NCR has been trying to switch over to using paper money, just like in the pre-war days. Trouble is that the exchange rates ain't exactly fair. For example, a hundred bucks in NCR money is valued at roughly half that in caps around here. Seems like a rotten deal for us, but work is work. Their trade routes are littered with bandits and raiders. Most of the army is in a standing order, where well, they're supposed to protect their people. I'm trying to get some reinforcements here, maybe some guns with some firepower, but shit. Things are just going slow. Their farms were plagued with problems and, and they lacking a specialist that they ended up hiring complete idiot to help them with delicate technology. They asked me how well I understood theoretical physics. I said I had a theoretical degree in physics. They said welcome aboard. The NCR has no actual end game. They just simply expand, spread too thin, and try to grab a hold as many resources as they can. It's no secret we've had better campaigns. Holding this whole length of river isn't easy. We're stretched thin and the long 15 just keeps getting longer. Compare that to the Caesars Legion, that you've been hearing bad things. To your eventual rendezvous in Nipton, and seeing the atrocities, you would think that they are the main bad guy or that they are the main protagonist for this game. I want you to teach everyone you meet the lesson that Kaisar's Legion taught here, especially any NCR troops you run across. While you are most probably correct, you will soon learn that in Legion's territory, it is much safer for traders to walk through the land without any worries of radius attack. And most of them are too scared to roam the land. They're my best customers. As long as you don't try to sell them chems or alcohol, they treat you fair. Hell, I don't even need to travel with guards most of the time in Legion territory. All the bandits are dead or run off. Heck, you can even pretend to be a trader and went into their camp. Very well, you may proceed. Their taxation rate is fairly low. The Legion is disciplined and ultimately loyal to their leader. I have Blackfoot in me, the first tribe that Caesar ever led in battle, the tribe that formed the Legion. If not for him, we'd still be living in tents or shacks, scavenging for food like animals, if we were alive at all. The Legion possesses a strong leader, feared by both his army and his foes. Walk away if you want, but if you do, he's going up on a cross. You're still making a choice. However, their progress is lost due to being a highly centralized government and is uh, at risk when its power fell to a wrong person. Come to think of it, perhaps Bethesda should keep the hero fantasy in their Elder Scrolls series. Try to treat it differently for Fallout. Fallout should make the player ponder and judge for themselves the ramifications of their choices and decision. It should reward and not even afraid to punish the players. Fallout should stay to its theme of civilization, coping with rebuilding at the end of time. Factions should be the type of people who cling to old world ideologies, an ideology which resulted in the demise of the old world, which eventually resulted in theirs. Keeping the right team and staying consistent with the law is essential. Fans of the series are harsh on Fallout 4 because they love the game, and rightfully so. They see the majority of people won't spend $60 randomly on a game and hating on it without any valid reasons or prior expectations. Fallout is a series that people love and hold dearly. Fans who bought the game are, at the end of the day, customers and then users. And they have the right to complain, voice their opinions and give him feedbacks, constructive or otherwise so that the developers would listen and improve their future products. Sure, some criticism do go unrealistic now, but that is something that no other form of media had any exceptions on. Music, films, literature, and other form of arts 
They did not escape from feedbacks and criticism. And for games to become and treated as arts, it needs to listen. I hope everyone who watches the video to this point would learn a thing or two. And here's to hoping that the next Fallout entry will be able to set your appetite for the perfect apocalypse. This video is made possible by your support. Thank you so much for subscribing. If you are new to this channel, welcome. Consider subscribing as there will be more of these types of videos. Let me know which topic should I cover next. Maybe even leave a feedback as I wanted this channel to be driven by you, the community. Leave a video a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you and see you next time.